on uh, uh, last Tuesday uh, night, uh, Lung Pa, and accompanied by myself uh, and Debbie, uh, went down to um, the Bay Area and uh, spent a night there doing various things. One of them being attending the uh, first Tuesday teachings uh, in Berkeley. <clears throat> and uh, Lung Pa uh, gave um, a discourse talk uh, in the evening uh, centered around um, several themes, related themes, but uh, concentrating a fair amount on uh, right effort, uh, the uh, increase and development of, of wholesome states of mind, uh, skillful states of mind, and the, the uh, abandoning of unskillful states of mind. And learning how to identify some of these uh, benchmarks uh, that are, uh, you know, indicative of development of wholesome states of mind and, and benchmarks uh, that, uh, of these kinds of states that we want to aspire, that we aspire to develop uh, and uh, are signs of, of progress quote unquote, progress in the, in the spiritual path if we, if we take them on and develop them fully. So I thought I'd, um, there's, a, there's a number of teachings in, in the canon and the Buddhist teachings that uh, point to these uh, skillful qualities that we're all uh, trying to develop on the path. Um, and uh, there's, you know, in various ways, uh, all of these uh, wholesome qualities um, kusala dhamma are uh, enumerated in, in all sorts of different sets and teachings. And I thought I'd maybe just go into a few of them tonight, but first wanted to maybe just give a little bit of a, a basis uh, for uh, how they work in general and the importance, underscoring the importance of the teachings on kamma. Uh, karma in Sanskrit, kamma as we say in the Pali, uh, the law of action, cause and effect, and just basically the overall idea, theme, that what we do does make a difference. We do have uh, uh, the ability to uh, change the way things are going for us. Life and experience is not just uh, one chaotic moment after the other, but follows certain trends, certain patterns. And according to the law of kama, such that whenever there is any kind of action in body, speech, or mind that has intention uh, as an underlying force, then there will be a, a resultant um, experience as well that's based on that, uh, on the moral intent of that action, whether it's harmful, skillful, harmful, unskillful, or beneficial uh, and, and skillful. So the law of kama, it, it, you know, as the Buddha presents it, even right in the very first noble truth, uh, the first, um, um, the first uh, part of the Eightfold Path, the first um, section of the Eightfold Path, samaditi, uh, one of the things that he considers as right view, or he, he proposes as right view, is the fact that there is this law of kama, that there is cause and effect. And you know, oftentimes we understand kama or karma as sort of this, as a way it's presented maybe in some other traditions or some other teachings, it's kind of this, it's almost equated with fate, meaning that uh, uh, specific actions that we do will have specific results uh, that are uh, inescapable. Uh, the way the Buddha teaches it is, is a bit more generalized um, and as an overall teaching that, yes, uh, what we do does have an effect, but um, there is also some uh, ways that we can influence uh, the way we experience the effects of our actions. Um, so it's not completely predetermined based on karma. Uh, and uh, there is a modicum of control over how we do experience uh, the results of karma and what we can do in, in the moment to, to uh, uh, influence that process. 
the Buddha talks about four different kinds of kama, uh, what he would call dark kama, light kama, uh, a mixture of dark and light kama, and then the fourth being the kama that leads to the ending of kama. And it's a, a very good distinction, um, dark kama obviously being the uh, uh, actions that would be considered unskillful, unwholesome, that lead to uh, harm, difficulty, pain, suffering, despair. Um, and then the light comma being those kinds of activities of body, speech, and mind that lead to well-being, to um, goodness, to uh, non-suffering, to non-harmfulness. Uh, and uh, those actions having uh, very good results both in our own hearts and minds and, and also in the world around us. So... You know, in the human realm, there's, you know, one could possibly say that the, it's about 50-50, uh, the amount of uh, negative karma and positive karma that's in effect, in motion, being um, experienced by, by us in many different ways. Uh, and um, so the human realm could be considered a mixture of, of uh good karma and bad karma being generated and the results of which being felt. And then the karma that leads to the ending of karma is, of course, one that we try and put our attention on uh, in, in the main uh, because it is uh, the actions, the understanding, the practice of the Noble Eightfold Path to realize deeply and penetrate the Four Noble Truths and, and lead us out of... Uh, the experience of suffering. There is, a, there is a path leading to the cessation of suffering. And this is the kama that leads to the ending of kama, taking up that activity of activities of body, speech, and mind that actually form the basis of the path to the unwinding of the whole uh, karmic process. And uh, one of the ways, one of the other teachings that this is uh, exemplified um, uh, or expounded on, uh, it's kind of a, a mouthful of a Pali word, uh, idipachyata. Uh, it's uh, some, uh, Ajahn Jeff, I like his translation of what that means. This, that conditionality uh, has kind of a ring to it that, uh, that appeals to me. And it's a simple four line stanza, but it packs in a big meaning that's, that's very, very um, helpful in understanding what we can do to realize our end of suffering. Uh, and it roughly goes, and this is Ajahn Jeff's translation, uh, when this is, that is. With the arising of this comes the arising of that. When this isn't, that isn't. From the cessation of this comes the cessation of that. <clears throat> and as Ajahn Jeff explains it so well in, in his book, Wings to Awakening, um, the first and the third, when this is, that is, when this isn't, that isn't, results uh, or uh, represents the ability uh, of us to um, affect uh, our course of action, uh, our trajectory, in the present moment. And the second and fourth, uh, with the arising of this comes the arising of that, with the cessation of this comes the cessation of that, um, points to how our uh, current activities will result uh, in the future uh, uh, in either wholesome or unwholesome uh, results, uh, depending on the uh, quality of what we put into the present moment. It also explains how, in the present moment, we experience the results from past action. It's sort of what he calls the, the linear part of it, whereas the first and third are the, the synchronic, in the moment versus over time. And it's, um, it's basically a very uh, beautiful, uh, sublime way of, of stating that, that um, we do, res we do receive and experience the results of past actions. It's a very complicated process. 
uh, hard to understand in detail. And the Buddha said, actually, it's one of the, the imponderables, the, the nature of all the uh, ways that uh, karma works uh, over time, particularly. Um, but uh, the, yeah, we, from past actions, intentional actions of body, speech, and mind, uh, we do experience in this moment the results of those. Uh, our experience in life is this constant uh, re-emerging of, of uh, the results of, of past action. Uh, and it's inevitable, uh, in a sense, that we will experience uh, these things. How, we, how certain events from the past uh, are, re- are, are received or experienced in the moment the, how those results are experienced now and how results will be experienced in the future are dependent on a huge number of factors all interplaying that, that it's really impossible to predict. Um, but we know it when we feel it. Uh, we know the, uh, the results of, of past experience when it comes to us in the present moment. So there, there's just a, you know, not a lot of control over that process that's already been set in motion. But in the present moment, we do have the capacity to experience the results of past karma in many, many different ways, uh, depending on how we attend to, in, attend to it. Uh, and then that will also influence uh, the motion, that we, uh, what we put into motion for the future. So if we, if we develop the qualities of, of the Eightfold Path and learn how to be present for what is arising in the current moment, then we have the ability to choose how to respond. This is the key uh, in that uh, we do have that power uh, as we develop mindful clarity of what is arising in the present moment and respond skillfully. If we respond skillfully, then the experience that we have right here in the present moment is going to be much more easeful and beneficial. If we respond skillfully, then the future uh, action or the future results that come from that action will also be much more beneficial, much more skillful. So that's just to underscore the fact that it's not deterministic. Uh, as as you might find in some of uh, the other teachings on karma from different different traditions, non-Buddhist traditions, uh, it's not uh, yeah, it's not deterministic. It's not just fate. We do have the ability to alter course, to change course. It's never too late to do that. And this is what getting back to what we we're originally talking about. This is this this sets. This is kind of the Um, basis for uh, right effort uh, because we do have that ability to uh, develop skillful qualities and to abandon unskillful ones and adjust the course of our lives, adjust the course of our kamma. Um, uh, We, you know, have this ability to steer ourselves according to the Buddha's path to complete freedom. So with that as kind of the basis, uh, the hope, uh, you know, with uh, learning uh, skillful activities, uh, developing intention, skillful intention, which is the basis for all kama, um, and uh, applying what's called uh, appropriate attention, uh, yoniso manasikara, as opposed to inappropriate attention, ayoniso manasikara, but using attention and intention to steer our course and establish that intention to, to really develop wholesome qualities, abandon unwholesome qualities. That's our basic core intention, our drive. Uh, and then to learn how to apply that um, uh, by knowing uh, what is skillful, what is kusala, and um, really working on those and developing those. So one of the teachings that I love to reflect on uh, brings up a lot of uh, inspiration for me and uh, really helps uh, settle the mind, uh, particularly as a preliminary uh, 
recollection uh, in, in meditation is a teaching that probably some of you uh, are familiar with uh, that uh, comes um, from Anuruddha uh, as he's uh, in meditation and reflecting. Um, this is before he you know, has, has realized the, fruits, the full fruits of the path. But in uh, one period of meditation when he was uh, dwelling ardent and resolute, as they say, he was considering what he called the, uh, the thoughts of a great being. And uh, he was reflecting on these, and while he was reflecting on them, the Buddha, who was staying somewhere at a distance, um, uh, was able to uh, tune into um, Anuruddha's uh, contemplations and, and uh, register, uh, be aware of what it was that Anuruddha was thinking. So he was listening to Anuruddha's thoughts, uh, during this, and um, uh, basically what uh, Anuruddha was saying, you know, in paraphrase, is um, that uh, uh, this Dhamma uh, is for one who has fewness of needs, uh, not for one who has a lot of needs or a lot of desires. Ajahn Jeff uses the word, this, is, this Dhamma is for one who is modest, not for one who is self aggrandizing. That's the first thought that uh, Anuruddha had. And then the next one, this Dhamma is for one who is content, not for one who is discontent. Then this Dhamma is um, for one who is uh, bent on seclusion or solitude, not for one who uh, delights in engagement. In, delights in, in company. This Dhamma is for one who uh, has energy aroused, not for one who is lazy. And this Dhamma is uh, for one who is mindful, not for one who is of muddled mindfulness. This Dhamma is for one who, whose mind is well composed, uh, well collected not for one whose mind is uncomposed, uncollected. And, uh, and then his uh, seventh thought that he came up with was this Dhamma is for one who has discernment uh, or is wise, not for one who is uh, weak with discernment. So he was reflecting on these uh, in his meditation, bringing them up for, for consideration. And the Buddha uh, was listening in and decided to go and uh, encourage Anuruddha. And so he was able to disappear, as they say, from where he was uh, in his abiding and then reappear in the presence of Anuruddha and praised him for uh, these, these thoughts of a great being and then added one. He said, you know, the, another one, an additional one, uh, another great thought, another thought of a great being is this Dhamma is for one who delights in non-proliferation, not for one who does not delight, or for one who delights in proliferation. So non-proliferation, uh, the word in Pali, nipapancha, uh, proliferation being papancha, which probably many of you have heard before, papancha proliferation. So delighting in non-proliferation. Also variously, um, translated as uh, non-complication or non-objectification, uh, Ajahn Jeff's translation. So he really praised uh, Anuruddha for this and said, basically, um, uh, you know, keep at it, go into seclusion for the upcoming rains retreat, uh, keep practicing uh, along this line. Um, and he went back to, the Buddha went back to uh, other monks and, and taught the same eight dhammas, saying that when you think about these, when you consider these, uh, your mind will become very uh, centered, very um, peaceful, uh, and it sets the stage for really developing samadhi very easily, uh, and then goes through the description of the four jhanas and, and how when one is picking up these particular eight thoughts uh, as a theme for contemplation, 
then uh, the mind will collect very naturally, will become composed uh, quite easily. Uh, which I think is interesting in and of itself in that he's, you know, he's not saying, you know, stop thinking completely, watch the breath, at, you know, at a certain point in your body and, uh, and go into uh, one-pointed concentration. He's not saying that. He's saying, you know, reflect on this theme. Bring it to, you know, um, real deep consideration. Uh, focus on it, put your attention on it, don't waver from that particular theme, uh, and watch what happens to the mind. It just naturally settles uh, just by bringing up these eight thoughts for contemplation. And, uh, and then from, on, from that point on, then one de- continues to develop the path. He, he kind of goes into a bit more detail at that point, too, with, uh, when he goes back to talk to the other monks and, and uh, kind of expands a little bit on those um, eight thoughts and essentially says, you know, well, what is this, you know, what, what are the details around this uh, delighting or this, uh, um, uh, what are the details around, say, the first one of um, this... Uh, This Dhamma is uh, for one um, who, uh, what's the first one? (laughs) Forgotten already. (laughs) Few wishes, few desires, few wishes, um, uh, and not for one who is of many desires, many wishes, or who want for one who is modest uh, and not self-aggrandizing. And... um, uh, I really like that because then he goes on to explain how is it that one uh, is of few wishes and uh, not of many wishes or one who is modest and not self-aggrandizing. He basically says, uh, such a being does not wish um, other people to know that he is one of few wishes. Uh, So he kind of turns it back on itself and says, uh, you know, that's what uh, the thought, that's what being modest means, not wanting to be known as being modest. Uh, and then it also means not wanting to be one who uh, has to be known uh, as uh, contented or uh, one who has to be not wanting to necessarily be known as uh, somebody um, who is delighting in seclusion or solitude, uh, not wishing to be known uh, as one who is um, uh, energetic or as mindful or as composed and collected or as uh, has discernment, is discerning or as uh, uh, delighting in, in nipa pancha, non proliferation. So that's what it means to be a few wishes. And then what does it mean to be uh, one who? Um, is, is uh, content, contented, being satisfied with the four requisites just as they are, satisfied with the basic minimum requirements of uh, food, uh, clothing, lodging, uh, medicines, and delighting in that. Uh, uh, and to one who delights in, in that kind of simplicity, that kind of being contented, uh, even the most modest scrap of food or the the most basic uh, form of shelter, uh, the root of a tree, uh, or the most um, basic kind of clothing, rag robes, um, or the most basic form of medicine, which is fermented cow's urine in that time. Um, Even those uh, seem like a, a feast or a set of very fine clothes or a palace uh, or the finest of the medicines that were available at that time, that with that kind of mind delighting in, in, in uh, that level of um, renunciation, the mind that moves out towards simplicity, renunciation, uh, and being contented, um, that uh, that person feels very wealthy uh, because it's the mind of delight that's uh, uh, the basis for it. Delighting in seclusion um, or solitude uh, 
he has a kind of a nice description of, of that, that being, that recluse, uh, who is so delighting in that, but also realizing that uh, he's subject to um, other monks, monks and nuns and laymen, laywomen, coming to visit him, coming to uh, talk with him, coming to spend time with him uh, and uh, talk the Dhamma. And the response that that, uh, the, the response from the, the being who's delighting in, in solitude or seclusion is to talk with the people that have come to visit him um, briefly enough so that they will want to go away <laughs> and leave them alone. Uh, talk about dis with dismissing in mind. Um, not as a, you know, not as an aversive kind of a reaction, but as one who just doesn't want to uh, engage in small talk uh, or nonsensical talk or just uh, chatter to pass away the time of day. One who is energetic uh, uh, basically is along the lines of, of what Lung Paul's talk on Tuesday night was around right effort, energetic, being one who is uh, very um, relentless and very uh, uh, energized towards establishing uh, skillful qualities and abandoning unskillful qualities and uh, doesn't let up on that, is always constantly searching what's going on uh, in his mind to uh, increase that capacity for uh, developing of, of the kusala dhammas. One who is uh, mindful uh, is pretty much uh, uh, described as, as that, being all, uh, mindful, alert, uh, and um, being able to recall with ease uh, many details from the past and uh, particularly of, uh, I assume, particularly of teachings that uh, are relevant uh, and keeping in mind certain themes uh, of the teachings that, that will be beneficial, like the, the four foundations of mindfulness or the four establishings of mindfulness, uh, skillfully keeping those in mind uh, all the time. Uh, right, or developing... Um, Composure, collectedness, uh, delighting in composure and collectedness and, and uh, not neglecting that. Um, uh, just essentially developing uh, the four uh, jhanas, the four uh, absorptions uh, as, as the way of presenting right uh, samadhi, sama samadhi, um, and really allowing the mind to collect and compose itself in a very gentle, easeful, simple way uh, without uh, forceful uh, striving, uh, but very easeful composure uh, and uh, unwaveringness, the very steadiness that uh, uh, the practice, the meditation practice can bring, delighting in that and developing that. Discernment, wisdom, um, essentially described as reflecting on and developing the insight that, of course, whatever arises uh, has the nature to pass away, uh, anicca, anicca sanya. And the, uh, that being the entry uh, into uh, uh, knowledge and vision of, of the way things are. And then the very Interesting one that he, the Buddha himself added at the end, the non-proliferation, um, non uh, non-complication, non-objectification. And uh, it's worth, I think, considering, you know, what does that mean? Oftentimes we think of it as mental proliferation, which it certainly is, that uh, the result of thoughts gone crazy, <laughs> thoughts gone awry, the, the whole thinking process gone astray uh, and out of our control, um, fueled by uh, greed, hatred, and delusion. You know, when the greedy mind or the aversive mind or, or the confused, anxious, fearful, dull, doubtful mind, restless mind, when that takes over and takes charge of 
ideas and thoughts that uh, are coming up, perceptions that come up, when those forces take control, then the thinking process starts to run amok and uh, it, we become kind of helpless victims to this rapid mental proliferation. Um, I really appreciate Ajahn Jeff's uh, use of the term objectification for papancha because it implies um, the sense of self becoming really wrapped up in, in the whole process to the perception of self, um, uh, of I making, my making, uh, ahankara, mamankara, uh, because um, that's what happens when, when we get overwhelmed uh, from the defilements, taking charge and controlling our thought processes. We start to create objects, which then, of course, creates the subject, the sense of me, um, and me in relation to the objects, the, the, uh, the ideas and opinions we have, say, when w we form them around other people, say, with, with, with whom we're having difficulties, or the desires, uh, how we objectify uh, the objects of sense desire, um, how we objectify people, how we objectify um, uh, food, how we objectify pleasant experiences in the sensory realm. Uh, and uh, because of that objectification, uh, not seeing it clearly, uh, the sense of self uh, becomes full on and launches out into trying to get away from or trying to get uh, those objects that we've created in our minds. So this is objectification, papancha, or non-objectification, non-objectification, non uh, nipapancha, uh, non-proliferation. And the, the person who delights in that, uh, and the person who develops that, uh, based on uh, an understanding uh, of not-self, uh, the mind settles, the mind composes, uh, and becomes uh, quite calm, quite peaceful. So those are these uh, eight very wholesome qualities, thoughts, uh, that one can start to wrap one's mind around just as a, as a, as a contemplative strategy, as a contemplative tool. Um, even if we you know, don't really have them uh, uh, at the basis of our being uh, right yet, if we haven't fully developed them, just bringing them into contemplation uh, as the Buddha says here, is it is in itself a skillful uh, form of contemplation and will naturally itself, just thinking about it, uh, lead one to um, a real sense of ease and well-being. I've been practicing with this particular contemplation for the past couple of days, bringing it up again as I periodically do, and I've just really noticed that um, uh, just spending some time going through this list you know, putting it to memory and reflecting on it and noticing the quality of, of feeling that comes up, uh, the, the sense of ease and delight uh, and a very light sense of well-being that then just really enjoys the, the, the sitting practice. The mind will start to naturally settle on a simple object uh, uh, based on just these recollections. It's a form of a, of a recollection. And I don't have to force myself onto the breathing, onto the breath. I don't have to, you know, uh, doggedly determine to uh, get rid of uh, everything else in my experience uh, and uh, uh, eliminate all the um, input and, and, and um, objects that come through the mind. If I focus on this theme, uh, that's, my, um, that's my mindfulness, uh, focusing on a, on a particular theme uh, and uh, letting it develop and settle the mind naturally into, uh, into a more settled, peaceful uh, state of mind that's happy just to be there.
and continue as long as uh, the body will let it. So this is taking, you know, the law of kama, the fact that we can adjust our attention with skillful intentions uh, and put it towards beneficial themes, uh, put it towards developing kusala dhammas, towards developing wholesome, skillful states of mind, and in the process, uh, allowing the unwholesome ones fade away by, by not paying attention to them. Right effort, the element of right effort. And there's many other skillful dhammas to develop uh, based on many of the other teachings, uh, and they're all in their own time worthy of uh, picking up for uh, contemplation to, to do the same thing in terms of settling the mind and uh, providing a wholesome course. But uh, this one from Anaruda is one of my favorites, and I think it's worth uh, spending some time just bringing into the heart uh, and seeing the effects that it has. So I think uh, that's probably enough for this evening. We'll call it uh, uh, call it an ending for now. <laughs>